Welcome to Smart Money Moves. This is your host, Tiffany Tippins, financial planner. And today we are going to be discussing debt and credit management. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm going to do a couple things this evening. Uh, and if you want to chime in to the show, please do call in to 240-455-5934. Again, that number is 240-455-5934. As I stated, we're going to be talking about debt and credit management. And um, just to give you a little bit of background, over the last three to four weeks, I have been talking about this subject on my other show um, located here in Dallas, Texas, uh, where my office and my company is housed. And on KHVN AM, which is Heaven 97 here in Dallas, um, we've been talking about debt and credit management to the extent where I've been getting calls on should I go to someone to fix my credit? Is bankruptcy the best thing for me? Uh, will someone fixing or repairing my credit take uh, items off of my credit report and how long will they stay off? Should I just not pay a bill? or uh, and let it fall off for after seven years. And so today I really want to jump right into um, the subject because I think it's so important, especially when our when it comes to our community on being educated about our finances. I'm going to switch the screen over uh, to a, a PowerPoint that I will go through. Um, just a couple slides in the PowerPoint and um, I want to just give a little bit background about my, about myself so you can feel comfortable with who is hosting Smart Money Moves and you'll know a little bit about me and how I operate my business. So we're going to go ahead and uh, switch over for a little bit. So give me a second in order to do that. Okay, uh, just to give you some background, I have been in the industry for about 16 years in the financial services. And how I got started in financial services and financial planning is very unique, probably more so unique than any other financial planner that uh, you may know. And so um, I initially got into the business in corporate benefits where I basically worked for a variety of corporations administrating their health and wellness benefits and retirement. And during that time, I also um, end up managing a grant with uh, a corporation or a nonprofit in Baltimore uh, called uh, Baltimore Credit Consumer Health. And there I learned so much about credit, how it works, um, what makes your credit score increase, what makes it decrease. And that's where I really, besides uh, getting the information uh, where I was administrating retirement and health plans, getting more information about credit and helping people repair their credit. So been in the industry 16 years. Currently, I am licensed in about 13 states, and um, I'm also securities licensed uh, in about six states, uh, including Texas, Maryland, Virginia, Georgia, and Michigan, uh, and also California, but 13 states with my life and health license. I, I hail my uh, bachelor's degree from and proud to be an HBCU graduate of Hampton University. Uh, and just a few years ago, I got my MBA from Drexel University, where I uh, had some study abroad in South America 
in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I currently hold an RPA designation, and RPA really stands for, um, oh, okay, I'm told that I'm not sharing my screen, so let me go ahead and do that. Again, this is our first show, so be a little bit patient while we work through the technical difficulties. So let me go ahead, go back to Skype and share my screen. Hey guys, this look it looks like I'm not able to do that now. I'm not sure what happened. But I'll go ahead and continue with the conversation. Uh since I can't find. Are you seeing it now? No. Okay. <laughs> um give me one second. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, I'm not sure what happened, but we'll go ahead. We'll continue with the conversation. Um, and uh, see if we can get this going. Let me go back to... I have no idea what happened. Let me go right Skype. Okay, there we go. I found it. There we go. You can see it now. Now you can see it. Okay. <laughs> So um, here's my little bio. Sorry for the technical difficulties. So we we've um, we've got it straight now. But um, as I was saying, uh, went back to school uh, a few years ago to get my MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation. And for any of those of you who are looking to go back to school at a later age, I would definitely say do it. Don't let age deter you from achieving and pursuing your goals. Um, when I did go back to Argentina, uh, and I say go back uh, specifically to South America, because I did some studies in uh, Brazil as well, uh, particularly in Rio. And uh, in Argentina, I learned Spanish and I use that in, in my practice today. Um, but as I stated earlier, I live here in Dallas, Texas. Um, this is where I run my practice, and uh, however, I'm I'm not only here in Dallas, uh, as I stated before, I'm licensed in 13 states uh, with a life and health insurance license, and about six to seven states with my series seven, 63, and 66, and uh, full fledged financial planner. As you can see on the next screen, these are the six areas of financial planning that I work with. So cash and credit management that we'll be talking about today and digging deeper into uh, retirement planning, protection planning, which is insurance, tax planning. I am a tax preparer that goes hand in hand in what I do on a day-to-day -day day -to -day basis with dealing with investments and insurance and overall financial planning. And of course, investment management. Um, investment management deals with advisory accounts, brokerage accounts, uh, 529 plans, 
I do work with mutual funds, stocks, and bonds. So when you think of a financial planner, just consider me a full-fledged financial planner. And lastly, estate planning. Um, we, we plan to come into this world and we also have to plan to go out. And so uh, with the estate planning, I really help people make sure that they have their wills and trust medical power of attorneys in order um, when you are planning the end stages of life after retirement, making sure that you have the proper beneficiaries in place uh, and that uh, your estate goes to who or, or what organizations uh, that you have instructed for it to go to. But those other topics we will be talking about over the next coming months during the show today we want to get into cash and credit management or debt and credit management and so when it comes to credit management um, we really want to focus on how the FICO score is made up and so I'm going to go ahead and switch and show a quick video of um, understanding your credit score and how the FICO is score is made up and what is encompassed in the FICO score. Consider this. If you were lending your own money to a friend, you'd want to make sure you'll get paid back. You'd probably wonder, have they paid their past debts on time? How much debt do they already have? And who else are they approaching for the loan? FICO scores help lenders answer these same questions every day, but through a mathematical formula that makes the lending decisions faster, safer, and more fair. So, it's really important you understand how your credit activities and behaviors are considered when calculating FICO scores. FICO scores focus on five key predictive categories. Your payment history, how much you owe, how long you've had credit, if you've recently sought new credit, and the types of credit you've used. Clearly, your payment history and level of debt substantially drive your FICO scores. Have you missed payments? If so, how often, how recently, and how late were they? Have you had debts turned over to a collection agency? Do you have tax liens, judgments, foreclosures, or have you filed for bankruptcy? The more recent, frequent, and severe the reported negative items are, the bigger the impact on your scores. Next, there's the debt you're already carrying. Are your credit cards nearly maxed out? How many accounts with balances do you have? How much of your available credit is being used? If you're overextended, you're more likely to miss future payments. Then there's how long you've had established credit, from your oldest to your newest account, and an average age of all your accounts. FICO scores also consider how often you've actively applied for credit in the past year. Rate shopping is accommodated for, and promotional, insurance, and employment inquiries don't count against you. Whenever you apply for credit, there's a good chance your lender is using FICO scores to help make that approval decision. So it's important that you understand your FICO scores, because it could help you know whether you qualify for low rates on your next loan. Know your FICO scores. Understand what goes into your scores. Excellent. So I hope the video explained a little bit to you what a FICO score is. And I want to go into the five categories a little bit more in depth of the FICO score. So as he talked about, 65% of your score is made up of... Why do you need to understand what a FICO score is and how it... How, your, how you pay your bills on time, 35% is made up of payment history. The other 30% is made up of amounts owed. And so that is going to be a major factor of how your score is made up. 30% um, of amounts owed, let's, let's kind of stick there for a minute. And so that's your outstanding balances, whether it's on credit cards, whether that's uh, the mortgage or home you own, whether that's your car payment, your student loans, or any uh, installment loans, 30%. What I always suggest when it comes to your credit cards, it is suggested to not exceed more than 50% of your account limit. Why? Because lenders look at that to see, to look at the other 35%. Are you going to be able to pay your bills on time. 
And it's a great indication if you are extended more than 50% of your credit limit, nine times out of 10, you're going to not make those bills on time or you're going to default. So you want to make sure you stay under the 50% of your credit limit and definitely pay your bills on time. Again, that is 65% of your score right there. And you know, if you experience being late uh, on a credit card debt or a home mortgage, and generally they don't report, the credit, the lenders don't report um, that you were late unless it's over 30 days. And so generally, if you're just, you know, a couple days late or a couple weeks late, you don't have to worry about that. But if you are over 30 days late, do know that it's going to affect your credit score. Not only do you want to pay your bills on time, but you want to avoid the late fees. And so now with these credit cards, uh, a couple things can trigger when it comes to being late. Number one, you're going to pay a late fee. So that late fee can be as little as $25. I've seen some late fees as much as $100 or a percentage of your debt. You definitely don't want to get into it when it's a percentage of your debt. The other thing that can happen with lowering your score uh, in payment history category is it changes your interest rate. So that introductory rate that you may have started out with 6% or 7% now goes up to the full 24%. Uh, so you definitely want to look at putting your bills, marking them on the calendar uh, where they pop up on your smartphone so you can remind yourself of paying your bills on time. The other 10% is new credit. And this really gets a lot of folks who go shopping. And so what type of new credit are you applying for? So here's how it works. You've seen it before. You've been in the mall whether it's Macy's, Nordstrom's, whoever it is, Best Buy, and they ask you, do you want to save 10 or 20 percent on, uh, on your purchase that day? Generally, nine times out of 10, you may want to say no unless you are trying to establish new credit. Uh, so that $10 or $15, if you already have a lot of credit, especially if you are already over the 50% account limit uh, for your balances, you don't want folks swiping your credit. As he stated in the video, um, that can count against you when you make credit application and a credit application. Matter of fact, not only can it, it will count against you. Your score will drop anywhere from 20 to 50 points. So if you're going to Banana Republic and you're having them check your credit, then you're going to Macy's and you're having them check, check your credit, then you're going to Best Buy, your score can be gone down 100 points by the end of the day. What's not going to affect your score is you checking it. So you can go on annual credit report. And I forgot to tell you, you may, may want to um, get uh, a pad and pen because I am going to be giving out a lot of good information. Go to annualcreditreport.com. That is where you can get a credit score for free. Okay. So from the three major bureaus, which is TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, you can go uh, on to annualcreditreport.com and get your credit reports for free once a year. This is what I suggest you to do here. I suggest you to stagger your credit reports. So for instance, it's uh, August now. If you wanted to order your credit report from Equifax, you can order that now. But by January, you want to order your credit report from TransUnion. And then the next few months, you want to order your credit report from Forum Experian. The reason why you want to check all three major credit report bureaus is because A, the lenders are not required to report on each of the credit reports. So I know when I lived in Maryland, Equifax was one of the major, majorly used uh, bureaus in the Maryland DC area, pretty much on the East Coast for the most part. Uh, I would see Equifax being 
used to check a lot of people's reports. And so you want to make sure you report all three, though, because your Wells Fargo, let's use that for example, might only report on Experian, but it won't report on TransUnion or Equifax. Or you could be a victim of identity theft on TransUnion and not on Experian or Equifax. So that's why you definitely want to re get your credit report from annualcreditreport.com for free. Okay. What does not come with that is your score. And so uh, the federal government passed a few years ago that all Americans get a, can get a free re credit, credit report from all three bureaus, but you have to pay for your score. Generally, the score can average anywhere from $10 to $20 um, to get your score. And average is about $15. And I'm going to talk about my FICO.com in a few minutes. This is if you if um, you're just tuning in, you're tuning in a smart money moves. We're talking about credit and debt management, and we are focusing uh, right now on the FICO score. I brought up my FICO.com because I've been using this site. It's a trusted site. Um, they give awesome information, and I'm going to walk you through the site in a few minutes as I um, finish the rest of the categories of what makes up your credit score. But my FICO.com is an awesome site to get information and to show you how you can fix your own credit report and increase your score. So we left off on new credit. Definitely don't want to be going into the stores getting someone to check your credit report, meaning you applying for a credit application. So what does not bring down your score is if an employer checks your credit report or if you have an inquiry, someone just out of the clear blue checks your credit report. And so you'll see that when you actually get things in the mail like from Chase or Wells Fargo, somebody wants you to open up an account. Lenders can actually go into um, your credit report and um, offer, give you a promotional offer. Those don't count against your score. So those won't necessarily make your score go down. However, when you apply for a new credit application, it definitely will um, make your score go down. So you want to make sure that you're not doing that multiple times in a 12 month period. Moving on to length of credit history. And I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to what should I have on my credit report? What if I'm not using a credit card? Should I close the account? When things will fall off on my credit report? So here's the deal with that. Again, 15% is made up of how long you've had credit. So I'll start with those who are just establishing credit. The best way if you are establishing credit is to have a secure credit card if you cannot go get credit by yourself. And so if you have a bank, if you're banking with PNC or Bank of America, generally they're going to have a secure credit card where you can set up an account where you put money in. Um, generally it's a savings account and basically you draw off of that card. Um, I'll also, again, I'll go into my FICO and they'll show you a variety of different credit cards um, that are available. Um, but the best and easy way is a secure credit card. And so that basically establishes how you're using your credit card on a monthly basis. Obviously, if you only have $500 in account, you can't withdraw over the account. And this is where you kind of practice that behavior of not exceeding 50% of the limit. So what you want to do is you want to charge that card, pay it off. Charge it, pay it off. That's the activity on your credit uh, on your credit card is what is going to increase your credit score. And so again, the easiest way is to do a secure credit card. Another easy way is to do a charge card. And so a charge card is what I just talked about. If you don't have any credit, you can get a credit card from Target or Best Buy or um, 
or Walmart. And I say from stores that you actually uh, frequent a lot. For instance, having a Target credit MasterCard is the easiest thing pretty much to do because they're going to nine times out of ten unless you ha don't have bad credit they're going to give you the credit card and so what you want to do is for your household items your groceries your toiletries things that you're buying already and that you're spending already from um from your income you want to charge those things but you want to pay them off so getting toilet paper, getting your hair accessories, um, getting, uh, again, just small items, household items uh, that you're going to pay for anyway. You want to charge it on that card, pay it off. You want a card that you can actually get some benefits from. So I know with the, the Target card, every time you shop there, you're going to get 5% off. What better way to save and you're building credit as well. Um, also, you want the, the card to be um, multi-purpose where you don't just have to use the card at, uh, at Target, but if it's a MasterCard, obviously you can use it anywhere. And so for those who are just trying to establish credit, so having a secure credit card at your bank or credit union or establishing credit by getting a charge card is the easiest way to establish credit. However, I am a firm believer that you really don't need more than three credit cards. When you have more than three credit cards, that's when you're going to run into uh, getting yourself in a heap of debt that nine times out of ten, you're going to be stuck in not paying off that, that debt on a monthly basis. Um, the other thing about length of credit history is if you already have credit and let's say you have an old credit card that you haven't used for a long time, but it's still open. It has a zero um, balance on it. Go charge on that card every now and then. The longer you've had the card, especially if you've had good history on the card, the better for you, the better to increase your score. Because guess what? If you close that card and you've had that card for 10 years, it's going to decrease your score. I know it sounds crazy, but having good credit on a particular card, even though you don't use it a lot, shows that you have established credit. If you actually close that card and start opening up new cards, that is going to hurt you. So if you have good credit card, good credit uh, on that particular card, keep it open. If you have bad credit on a card and you've had it for a long time, and you have been late multiple times on that card, it is best to close that card. So what you wanna do is you wanna close the card and you want to start making payments on the card. Um, what I uh, suggest you do, and this is what happened to me <laughs> or occurred last week when I had the show on KHVN. Um, Someone didn't call in, but they waited a couple days to call me back and said, hey, I've consolidated my debt. Um, my husband filed bankruptcy. Uh, I was trying to put all my debt together. And now I have, let's say, consumer credit counselors. And I'm, uh, I know there's a consumer credit counseling uh, agency that helps people consolidate their debt. I'm not speaking specifically to them, but there are a lot of credit agencies that will help consolidate your debt. And so what they do is they will call the lenders and say, hey, we want to consolidate this debt and we want to uh, put a payment plan together for this person to pay off their credit card and so in such and such time period. Guess what? The same thing they did, you can do. And what she did, she said, I haven't seen my credit increase. And I said, well, you know, have you had any new credit inquiries? She was like, well, I'm trying to, you know, buy a house. And um, I had the lender check my credit score. And here's to my point four. You do not want to exceed more than three inquiries in a month unless it is applying for a house or a car. If you are working with a broker, 
And a broker is someone, and I'm speaking mortgages now, a broker is someone who basically can shop a loan for you. And so really, they only need to pull your credit once. Um, they can know what your credit score is and they can send your file to a variety of different lenders. They don't need to pull your credit multiple times. However, if you're shopping the loan yourself, and let's say you're shopping with Wells Fargo, then you're going to Bank of America, and then you're going to Chase. Um, you don't want to do that more than three times in a month unless it's applying for a house or, or a car. The lender knows that you're shopping it, but you don't want to do it more than three times. To me, it's best to work with a broker. Same with the car. If you're going to um, several different dealers and every dealer you want to go to to pull your credit score, you don't want to do that more than three dealers because now your credit score is going to go down. Uh, so going back to the point, length of credit history, you want to keep those things that are open that are good credit for those things that you have had issues paying your credit cards on time. You want to close those accounts and make arrangements to pay for the debt on your own. You can negotiate with lenders on your own. You don't need anybody to do that for you because what these credit card agencies will do, and I'll get back to that score, they're going to charge you for doing what you could have did yourself. And so essentially with her, she paid, she was paying an extra $400 um, to them where she could have paid that on a bill. Uh, so with Google now, you can Google negotiation letters to lenders. Uh, I'm going to go to my FICO in a few minutes and kind of peruse the site and show you what they have that's very educational when it comes to financial literacy and helping you manage your credit better. And the last category is the 10% um of your score is made up of the types of credit that you use and so the 10 percent is going to account for do you have a mortgage do you have student loans do you have installment debt like a um a personal loan or an equity line of credit do you have charge cards charge cards meaning you charge it and then you pay it off you charge it you pay it off or do you have revolving credit? Um, and so these are the types of different credits in use that lenders look at your score. It's a small percentage. However, it is very important that you just don't have credit cards. Um, they do want to see that you have other types of debt involved and particularly a mortgage is um, and student loans are considered uh, good what well, I would say good debt in a sense of they know that you're an educated person if you have student loans. So nine times out of 10, you're going to be making a little bit more money than someone who is non-degree. Uh, and that's just statistical. Uh, and when it comes to a mortgage, they know there, there's an asset backed up on that debt. And so this is how what 100% of your score is made up. 30% is the amounts of outstanding debt you have. Again, you don't want to spend more than 50% on what you have in your credit limit. You want to make sure you're paying your fees or, or your, um, your payments on time to avoid the late fees. That is 35% of your credit history. 10% of new credit. Remember, you don't want to be, it's back to school time. You don't want to be going to the mall and having everybody check your score because that is going to bring your score down. 15% uh, is how long you have established credit. And for those who are just establishing credit, you want to look at secure credit cards or charge cards to get you started. And then lastly, you want to have a mix of credit, not just uh, credit cards. Uh, or charge cards, but some student loan debt, installment, personal loans, and mortgages. So this is how your credit score is made up of. But what I want to take you to is my FICO. And so if you can see here on my FICO, again, I've been using this site when I managed um, a credit uh, 
credit score um, improvement project where we basically went to a community in Baltimore for low income residents and taught them how to increase their score. And we did it right through myfico.com. Now that was early 2000s. I want to say 1999, 2000. Six, uh, 16, 17 years later, this site has still been around and it, it has improved tremendously. And so what I like about this site is they have a couple different product products. Remember I said you can order your credit report from annualcreditreport.com for free. You don't need to do that from, from this site. However, you can order your score from this site. So on this site, you can order one score and get credit, get credit monitoring. To me, you don't necessarily need credit monitoring. Your bank or credit card already does that. Um, mainly, I use this site to help my clients with checking their score. That's pretty much about it. Um, you can order from the three credit bureaus here. Uh, or you could just do the one-time reports and scores, which I generally do is I generally order one from the credit bureau, whether it's Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian, or you can order all three, and then you can compare the products here. This is what I really like about this site because it has interactive tools on the site. So talk about achieving your goals. Here's credit repair. They're telling you already what to do with fixing your credit. Now, I wish I could really go through a demo uh, on the site, but it just pretty much tells you how secure credit cards work, what's the ba best way to manage uh, your growing credit debt. But this is what I like. They tell you right here of, you know, how to, um, how long it'll take you to pay off your debt. And so here you can basically put in how much you owe, how much is your future monthly charges if you know you're going to be continuously charging on this account how much you want to pay every month what your interest rate is what your annual fee if there's an annual fee and when you want to pay it off and then right here you just click your results you will go into the results page and it will basically tell you by paying off your credit card debt now you'll save two hundred and three dollars in interest costs so here's a couple options for you. If you uh, want to pay off $3,000 in debt in the next 12 months, you'll need to make monthly payments of $272 and make no additional charges. That is super simple. So it's basically saying, hey, if you want to pay off this credit card of $3,000 in 12 months, you don't need to be using this credit card and you need to make a payment of $272. However, Given your anticipated payments of $500 and your anticipated charges, you'll have to repay your outstanding balance in 15 months. So it's not going to take you 12 months to pay off this debt. It's going to take you 15 months. And basically, it shows you a graph of how much interest um, you've paid. And so here um, we can see the interest on the graph. Uh, here with how much interest you've paid on the credit card it'll also give you some tables going back to goal um, going back to goals it has a variety of different goals mortgage goals so basically I just showed you something quick about um, credit cards this is what how you want to be armed with knowing what your based on your credit score how much you can borrow so it'll tell you how much will your mortgage payments be based on um, your credit score how much uh, can you borrow is a 15 year fixed rate 10 or 20 best for you so this is information that you need to be knowing before you step into a dealership and before you step into a mortgage off office um, here with auto loans, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Yesterday, I was uh, in the studio doing smart money moves in um, in the studio here in Dallas, and uh, one of the employees there 
she knows I do personal finance. She knows I'm a financial planner. She's like, Tiffany, I need a car today. And I said, okay, you need a car today. She's like, yes. So she told me the story of what happened. And she was like, you know, I need a car. So if I'm just a financial planner, I shouldn't say I'm just a financial planner, but I'm a financial planner. And if I was a finance person or sales person at uh, a dealership, I know she's desperate. So I'm going to try to sell her if, if it's somebody unethical, pretty much anything that I know I can get her into because I can tell in her voice that she needs a car and she needs it right away. And so what I told her, I said, you know, what's going on with your car? Do you have a note on your car right now? Is it paid off? So she says it's paid off. Um, I don't want to necessarily have a note, but you know, I have some issues with my credit. So I said, here's what I want you to do. Go to myfico.com, go to achieve my goals, go to auto loans, check your credit. It's going to tell you your score. How much do you want to pay in your, in your monthly mo notice, uh, every month in your monthly note. Don't let someone at the dealership tell you how much you should be paying. You can figure this stuff out right here. So let's just say she said, I can put $3,000 down on the car. I want my payment to be $350 a month based on my credit because they will tell you once you get your credit checked here, they will tell you based on your score how much or what type of interest rate you'll get. So 5% is for somebody who has fairly good, uh, good credit. So I'm just going to say 9%. Okay. And I don't know what that score would be. But let's just say her interest rate is 9%. And um, her, her long terms are um, 48 months. She doesn't have a trade-in. She's not getting a rebate. When I actually click these results, I know based on what she put in, she can only afford a car that's sixteen or seventeen thousand sixty-five dollars. Okay, so she's gonna need to qualify because she's putting three thousand dollars down for a loan is $14,065 to finance her purchase. That includes her down payment. She doesn't have a trade-in. She doesn't get a rebate. That's her monthly payment. And then that's her the terms of the loan. I don't suggest that somebody does more than five years. In, in my opinion, I think five years is long too long to purchase a car, um, mainly because the um the appreciation values go out on cars in the in the first two years really when you first drive off on the lot but basically definitely in the first two years you really shouldn't be having a car longer than a car note longer than three to four years uh to free up your money for other incidents emergency savings or other things that you want to plan for in life and so here basically it told her what she could afford if she had the trade in let's say she she had four thousand dollars to trade in and she was getting a thousand dollars back on her rebate we can recalculate that now she can get a car that's twenty two thousand sixty five dollars she needs still needs to finance fourteen thousand sixty five dollars so that's what her loan is going to be so the more she can bring to the table the better i've been there i'm sure you've been there and you know the hustle when it comes to dealerships in that finance office they have you sitting there several hours kind of fiddling around you don't even need to go through that you can go armed with the information by going to myfico.com and getting this information okay um and i think it's just the lack of knowledge that people don't know when it comes to personal finances of what they can be doing on their own you can go to google and put in myfico.com coupon or my fico coupon and generally they have a 20 to 25 percent coupon off of getting um your credit score and report and so 
your credit score shouldn't be any more than $16 on here um, from one of the bureaus. If I was to check any report, I would check um, Equifax. Equifax is probably the number one credit bureau in the country amongst uh, Experian and TransUnion. And so those are the three that I would go with. But Equifax is probably the number one out of all three with TransUnion being the last. Here's some other basic information that I went through, but it gives you more in-depth history of, you know, what it, what's in my score, my payment history, amounts owed, your credit mix, new credit, uh, and so forth. So you can definitely get more information by just going on the website and um, clicking on learning more about your scores and then here i know um this is you know find my savings and my credit card i mentioned to you here's a good graft on what's excellent credit and what's not so excellent credit so generally um low scores start at the lowest you can get is 350. um so you can see here between 350 and 599 that's bad okay uh, between 600 and 659 that's fair 660 to 719 is a good credit report good score and between 720 and 850 is excellent so uh, I know it's back to school time I know some parents are looking uh, to have certain credit cards set up for their uh, their children while they're away at college here's the best student credit cards it basically tells you right there through Capital One. Um, another great uh, website to go to to find um, credit cards that are best is Bankrate.com. And so you can find a little bit of everything on Bankrate.com. Here's another thing that's going to affect your credit score. Auto insurance. I know a lot of people... Um, do not think their credit score is uh, tied to auto insurance, but yes, it is. Uh, so you want to make sure I, I'm, I'm not promoting travelers um, or getting a quote here, but it says here, this is what I want you to read, what my FICO score has to do with my car insurance. It has a lot to do. And when I just talked about a consumer with good FICO score may pay up to 50% less on this car insurance premium. Uh, so it's, it's important to know what your credit score is. As I mentioned to the lady yesterday who said she needed a new car and she changed her mind about getting a new car and getting our car fixed after I told her what I did. Um, I said, you know what, when you think about getting a new car, you may also want to think about how much that new car auto insurance is going to be. Okay, and so, you know, she had a 2004, let's say, Mercedes. Now, um, we know what she could qualify for, but let's say they're trying to get her in a 2014 Mercedes. Well, it's a newer model car, and that means her car insurance is going to be higher. So, even if she is in her note, which nine times out of 10, depending on what her interest rate is going to be, which is extremely important uh, when applying for a loan. The interest rate is going to drive your payment. I said, you know what? Before you go in, you need to figure out what kind of car you want, what you can qualify for, which I just showed her through this website, as well as uh, call your insurance carrier and get a quote a pre-quote on the new car you want, how much is your car insurance going to go up? Because now she's gone from zero payment because she didn't have a car to a car payment plus higher insurance because she has a new amount of car. So those are the just the things that I want you to think about when it comes to managing your credit as well as... Um, managing your debt as well again you are tuning in to smart money moves uh, i am your host tiffany tippins if you have questions you can call into 
It has been a pleasure talking with you. There is one more thing that I want to wrap up before we end the call. And that is um, debt management. And a lot of uh, a lot of folks, I want to go back to the PowerPoint on um, talking about cash management and debt management. Um, is most people don't have a spending plan or what we simply call a budget. Um, that's going to be looking at you know what income you have coming in to what's essentially going out. And so here I have a quick uh, pie chart talking about how you can manage your cash. So income, you need to be saving between 10 and 15%. Please do not let that be on a credit card because putting things on a credit card, you're paying three and four times more than that. Remember, if you're not getting a good credit rate anyway, even if you have good credit, if you miss a, a payment, that goes up, that drops your score. And you're just paying on the interest nine times out of 10 if you're making the minimum payment. Your overall savings of your income should be six to 12 months of expenses. That's liquid. And the reason I say that is it really depends on how fast you can get back to work. Uh, so you want to at least give yourself six months if you are off of work, you can't find a job, or maybe you're disabled temporarily. Um, you want to at least give yourself six months of expenses because and I say expenses not income because nine times out of ten more of us have higher expenses than our income. You want to pay down the debt with the highest interest rates and look for areas that can make immediate changes. So when we look at this it shows us based on our budget we should only have about 35 percent allocated to housing, that's rent or mortgage. Of course, 10% to our savings. Other living expenses, those that includes eating out, which most, most people don't budget, they just do it. Vacations, entertainment, clothing, especially women. You know, we can get real happy in a store uh, and we don't account for that other 25% on, I would call, as I call, emotional purchases. Uh, so you want to make sure, sure you stay within that other living expenses of 25%. 15% is transportation. So what I talked about, not only your car payment, but gas, insurance, repairs, parking tolls, and if you're taking um, public transportation as well. I know in the D.C. metro area, a lot of people take the train or public transportation during the week and then drive on the weekend. And so you have to factor in that 15% of of your spending plan and then um as i went over your debt should be called considered 15 percent, which is student loans credit cards personal loans uh charge cards again trying to stay under and within that 15 percent range so we have had a full conversation it is five minutes uh, before we go off the air, I just want to leave um, my personal information to you. And actually, I'm going to pour it back to, I'm going to share my screen one more time and pour it back to my website, which is impactfulsolutionsgroup.com. Uh, uh, that is where you can find me and uh you can also go on our financial resource page that will give you plenty of calculators when it comes to financial planning whether it's retirement planning um putting money in your 401k how to invest how to um, plan for insurance and a, a variety of different financial calculators paying off credit uh, what's your current cash flow that will take you to another site of um, additional financial information so here's where you can reach me uh, you can reach me on 800-408-8850 again that number is 
408-8850. that is my mailing address. I'm here uh, downtown Dallas at 400 North Irve. And, uh, or you can reach me at Tiffany at Impactful Solutions Group. I'm also on Facebook at Impactful uh, Wealth Solutions and at Twitter at Miss Money Savvy. I will be on every Sunday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and uh, on um at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sunday. Next week, we're going to be talking about college planning. Again, I mentioned to you that I am an HBCU graduate from Hampton University. We're going to be talking about college planning and also giving back to our HBCUs, which is so important uh, when it when we talk about estate planning and continuing legacies um, that our HBCUs um, have worked so hard to to um, build found, solid foundations for future generations. And so definitely giving back is a must. You don't want to just be a graduate, but you want to be an alumni that gives back. And I'll also have on the show uh, a colleague of mine and a uh, former classmate of mine, Halima uh, Francis, and she'll be talking about philanthropy for HBCUs and how we can continue to build on our endowments, our uh, financial endowments, so that our HBCUs continue to thrive uh, and build solid found- solid um, foundations for our educational platforms when it comes to future generations. Again, Tiffany Tippins, you're a host of Smart Money Moves. Thank you for tuning in. And again, Hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Have an awesome night.